So I'm going to go over the numbers from this summer. So I will present the cover crop based organic uh, reduced till trials that we had at Arlington Ag Station this summer. So I will start with the no-till soybeans uh, that we had in, in winter cereals and that we had in spring planted cereal rye. That's another technique that could be used. And then I will go over to organic no-till corn or what we tried to, to do with that and finish with the interseeding cover crops in the organic corn. So the no-till beans, we had it on a six acre plot, uh, six acre field, and we had uh, 20 plots that were 0 0.3 acre each. So they are 30 feet wide and 450 feet long. So we can use like 50, 15 feet wide uh, farming equipment. And we had four different cover crops and one control. So what, what is brown here is the control, which has no cover crop. And you can see that it's replicated uh, four times. So in terms of uh, cover crop, we use two different species, that are triticale and cereal rye. And for the triticale, we had two different varieties that are uh, NE426GT and 815. And the GT doesn't stand for glyphosate tolerant, but it's kind of funny that it's named like that. Uh, so the planting date for that was September 19th of 2016. And we planted it three bushel an acre and 1.75 inches deep. Uh, for the cereal rye, we had a rooster and spooner and we planted it on September 26, uh, three bushel an acre at 1.25 inches deep. So if you're wondering why we planted the rye later than the triticale, there is no uh, real reason for that. It's just that it started to rain when we were planting the cover crop and we had to wait a week to go back to the field and finish planting. And in terms of difference in uh, planting depth, the triticale is slightly deeper because um, it's more uh, winter sensitive and we were um, thinking that putting it deeper would uh, increase the chances of overwintering. So we use the John Deere 1519 no-till drill that you can see here. And as for the biomass, we had, so that's the pounds of dry matter per acre that we had before terminating the cover crop. So we had about 11 pounds, 11,000 pounds of uh, dry matter for both varieties of rye. And that's pretty much where we want to be. We don't want to be lower than 10,000 pounds. And for the triticale, we had higher biomass. So we had about 13,000 pounds for the first variety and 15,000 pounds for the second variety. But my guess here is that we didn't have um, much more tillers, but the, the stems of the, of the triticale are um, much thicker than the rice, so it may just be heavier because of that and not because it's more dense or more covering. Uh, for the soybeans, so we had 1.7 relative maturity soybeans on 30 inches row, uh, 225,000 uh, seeds per acre at one inch deep. So we had two different planting strategies, as Erin already mentioned before. We had the early planted uh, soybeans, so planting green in the standing cover crop when it's at boot stage. So that's the first picture that you have here. So boot stage is right before the head starts to go out of the leaf. So you actually notice boot stage when it's toward the end of that, but that's fine. And the reason why we want to plant at that time is that we um, assume that the, the beans are going to be big enough when the cover crop reaches emphasis to be able to roll on them without hurting them. So the boot stage happened on May 12 for the rye, and we planted the control at the same time, and it happened slightly later for the triticale on May 20th, so that's when we planted the soybeans. Um, for the rye, there is only one date, but uh, Aroostook is slightly earlier than Spooner, so there is always three days difference, but I just put average here. So late planting is the most uh, common um, planting that we have. So it's planting at crimping when the, the cover crop uh, reaches anthesis. So you see a picture of uh, anthesis here. Erin already described uh, what it is. And that happened on June 2nd and June 8th this year. So that's when we planted the, the late planted soybeans. I have a video here if it works. So that's the early planting or planting green. So we use the John Deere 1750 Max Emerge Plus. And it's not a modified planter. So it's just like a classic normal uh, corn planter. We didn't do any modification on that. 
And what happened is, uh, so you see these pictures, so these beans were planted the same day with the same planter, and some of them were planted in the cover crop, some of them in the bare ground, and you see that the, the trench on the left side is totally open, so it's open to rain, it's open to bugs, it's open to anything that want to go in there and, and reduce the, the germination percentage. <coughs> Uh, so this is the late planting, so planting at crimping. So that time we had a modified planter and the roller, roller crimper in the front. So I, you can see the pollen coming off of there. <laughs> so the planter. So modified planter. Um, so we added some no-till cultures as well as double disc openers to be able to uh, cut through the, the rayon and open it to put the seed in, and we had uh, down pressure strings as well as um, weight on it to to just increase the down pressure and be able to put the seed as deep as we want, so one inch deep here. So there is still progress to make on that, but we're trying to get there. So that's the second problem that we had this year after the open furrow. We also had um, some army worms. So when you have a cover crop, you also bring the pests and the diseases that come with the cover crop. And even if army worms are not known as being a, a pest for soybeans, uh, they lay eggs in grassy plants, so the, the rye is actually a nice host for them, and, and they were developing in the rye, and when we saw that, we were worried that the, the worms would attack the, the, the neighbor's cornfield, and we sprayed anthrax, which is an organic, um, which is a organic certified uh, pesticide, and, and we felt like we killed enough of them. So on the right, you see that the, the worms are, are dead, and that's what we saw like a couple days after spraying the, the pesticide. So going into the development, I had um, Roger, who is in the back of the room, come with a drone and take a picture of the plot from above. And I think that we see some interesting differences here. So first of all, you see that on the right side, so all this side of the field, is the early planted side where we planted the soybeans uh, in the standing cover crop. And you see that the, the stand is way uh, poorer than on the other side. So we had, we don't know why. Is it because of the wet and cool spring that we had? Is it because of this open furrow? We're not sure, but we had a poor stand on the early side. And if you watch the different um, cover crops, so looking at the two different triticale, you see, um, on the, on the second one, I mean on both of them, you see some white patches. So these are places where the cover crop, like the right, the, the roll triticale, sorry, is covering the ground, but the mat is so thick that the beans didn't make it through it. And you see some, something else on the first um, variety. So the, the light green patches here are actually patches of weeds. So what we think happened is that the the cover crop winter killed here, so the weeds just made it through. Um, it's patchy like that. We're thinking that it may be because of the snow cover that was kind of patchy. Like, for example, this place was covered by snow, so it offered winter, and this place was not covered, so it did not offer winter. Um, going to the control, so there is a, a big hole here. So the last time we went with the row cultivator, the early planted side of the treatment was a bit too big and we actually pulled some beans out just to point out that cultivating is not without any risk neither. And that's all for this picture. So going to stand count, uh, it's pretty obvious here that uh, so the control is here and we had the same, the same stand, doesn't matter if we plant early or late. Um, and you see that in the different cover crop we actually had only half of the stand than we had in the in the control, or even less for this last triticale. Um, and then the yield, so the yield, like it's the same for the, the control, it was about 45 bushel an acre for both the early and the late uh, treatments. But the other interesting thing is, so first you see that uh, in a rustic and spooner, we had about the same yield as in the control, so it can, be com competitive with the, the normal uh, planted soybeans. And another thing that you see is, so we had half of the stem here, but with, with half of the stem, 
we had more than half of the yield. So I ran the numbers, and what you see here is the percentage of the control. So for the beans planted in Aroostook, we had 55% of the stand in beans, but we had 75% of the yield. And for all the green, for all the green uh, cells here, the yield ratio is 20% higher than the, the stand ratio. So in other words, with 90% of the we had 90% of the yield from only 70% of the stand. So the soybean stand very poor in nodule soybeans. It's kind of alarming. It was the first time for me doing that, and you go out and you see that there is a very poor stand, but the, the soybean can partially compensate for a poorer stand. So that's all for the no-till uh, beans. Um, so what can I say? Yeah, no, see, it, it is not a, no, a one-fits-all system. So for example, if you want to play with your planting date, you have to consider the climate. For that year, the wet and cold spring didn't work very well for early planting. You also have to think about the number of passes. Are you very busy at that time? Can you, can you afford going twice for planting and rolling? And another thing you want to consider is RTK. So for example, if you roll and then you want to plant after, you're not going to see where you're planting because your markers are not going to work. So if you don't, if you don't have RTK, it's going to be very hard to do that. Uh, the cover crop variety, depending on um, maturity. So for example, Roostook is earlier than Spooner. Um, depending on the, on the overwintering capacity, depending on if you're um, more north or more south, you're going to choose different cover crop. So that's all things you have to think about if you want to implement that on your own farm. So for next year, we're going to have um, early planting versus late planting again. And we have the same varieties of rye. We still have one of the triticale, and we have immersion wheat. So I'm not sure what it's going to overwinter, because this winter is kind of uh, funny. It's, it's cold, and we don't have a bunch of snow to protect the crops. And we want to do more economic analysis because you see there is no number, there is no dollar behind that, and, and I think it's very important for, for you. And we want to work a lot more on equipment modification because I think we, wanna, we can uh, lower our soybean seeding rate and have, have better yield if we work on our closing wheels and our down pressure. Okay, so soybean in the... Um, spring planted cereal rye. So the key pr principle of that is vernalization. So it's the need for exposure to a period of cold in order to flower. And rye needs vernalization, which means that if it doesn't, um, it, it is not exposed to, to cold, it's not gonna go to stem and to head. So it's just gonna tiller and stay like a grassy plant. So um, the, the goal was to have this rye stay grassy and cover the ground and plant the soybeans in that. So we planted the rye on April, tw on April 12th, uh, two bushel an acre, one inch deep, and, and a month after we came back and planted the beans in it, 250,000 uh, seed, seeds per acre, one inch deep. And so that's what we had one month after planting. So this the stand count you see is very low. So I'm not sure what happened. I don't know why the soybean didn't grow. But as you can imagine, if the soybeans don't grow, you're not going to have much canopy closure, and you're just going to have a wheat field. So that's what happened to us. You see in the back of the picture, it's pretty yellow. So it's, it's another bean field, which, which turned yellow because of the soybean leaves. But our field here was brown because of the weeds. But sometimes it works. I'm not sure where it was, but Erin um, met a farmer who's done that, and that's where she kind of got the idea. Um, this that farmer made it work. Is where I got the idea. So yeah. Okay. <laughs> so back to the audience. <laughs> but this was another farm in uh, southern Wisconsin that I also got a chance to visit. And you can see where, like Leia was saying, we'll go vegetative. And if we get a typical summer where it actually gets dry, so this is not, nothing with cover crops, like I said, is foolproof. But if we get that drier period we typically do in July and August, that photo on the right, it actually dies back to a um, killed mulch residue. And um, this field uh, that, was, that the farmer in, um, I think it was Rock County had done, um, you see some weeds popping through there, but 
he didn't do any other cultivation, and it was a beautiful stand, and it, it, it actually yielded higher than his till beans, I think in the mid-30s, which was he was very happy with. Um, but what he did differently, and I, like Leia said, I don't know what happened with our planter issue this year. We definitely want to try it again. But what he did, I think we also planted the rye too early. And I know Jack, that's more south of us, plants them at the same time, I believe in mid-April. But we thought, I thought that if I plant the rye earlier, um, I get, might get more early wheat suppression. I was worried about waiting too late and having those later um, spring weeds take off. But I think I, by planting that early, that we may have had some regrowth because we got cold enough in April that it may have induced a vernalization. So the farmer here, he planted in southern Wisconsin on May 2nd, and then I think came in two weeks later and planted the beans. So there's still a lot of refinement that needs to be done to the system. I don't want to, sometimes I get calls from farmers saying they've done 600 acres or something, and it makes me, anything of this, I would start small and experiment. Um, but I think it is an interesting system. But, but I, you've asked Jack, but he, he would any of the cover crops again, some years it works great, some years it doesn't, it's a tool in the toolbox, but, Nothing's foolproof and organic. There aren't any silver bullets, at least at this point. Yeah, so we're gonna try again next year to see in different climates, or we're gonna have we're gonna have them on 30 inches row instead of drilling them. Uh, so going to the no-till corn, uh, it's pretty new for us. So it's a new phase of research, and some states, uh, as Erin mentioned, had been maybe successful with hairy veg and cereal rye, but we uh, prefer to have uh, only a legume cover crop. Um, in terms of nitrogen availability, it's better because if you have cereal rye, it's going to take some nitrogen that you cor your corn needs. And also for pests, like I pointed out earlier, the armyworms, what if you increase your risk of having armyworms? You really don't want to do that. So it's better to have legume instead of another grass. And we would like to have an overwintering legume, which is pretty hard here. Because uh, we want we want to be able to terminate it effectively and and and, and plant the, the corn early enough. So what we tried to do this year, first of all, we had a full planted mix of uh, peas and oats. Uh, so it was planted on September 19, 50 pounds per acre of each of the of the crops. So the peas were three inches deep. We saw that we would have a higher chance of having them over winter by putting them deeper but they actually didn't emerge at all because I guess they were buried. So we didn't have any cover crop to play with, so we couldn't try that. But we had some spring planted uh, cover crops, so chickling veg and field peas. Um, so we came on June 8th and planted the, the corn uh, in the growing um, cover crop. And what you see here is a picture of, the, of each of the cover crop four days after planting. So what you see in the peas is that by coming with the planter, we actually killed a lot of peas, but we didn't kill them the way we wanted to, because the way we wanted to terminate them was with the roller to actually have them cover the ground very well. But we had like, yeah, we had some of them dying like that. And here you see the corn growing in the peas. So the corn actually emerged in the peas. So you see like here, the row was totally open, so we, when you see soil, you see weeds. <laughs> I've heard Aaron say that all the time. And, and, and on June 27, so 20 days after planting the corn, we came with the roller crimper on the cover crop and the corn. The corn was at V1. So there is no picture of that, and it was not a success, but you have a picture of what happened um, on July 24, so a month after uh, rolling the, the cover crop and the corn. So we killed a lot of corn. So please don't roll your <laughs> your corn. And so the yields were super bad. You ha we had like 17 tons per acre of dry matter. It was corn silage, but I'm I'm guessing a lot of that was actually wheat. So corn is not as resilient as soybean, and it's way more impacted by the roller crimper. And the peas and veg termination wasn't successful. We had poor root suppression, like. You can see here, it's like full of weeds. Uh, so next year, we, we're gonna try again full planted peas and oats. This year, our peas emerged, but hopefully they're gonna make, three, they're gonna make it through the winter. And we're looking for other spring planted legumes, uh, as well as working on other strategies for cover crop termination. Um, as far as other strategies for termination, 
why aren't you flaming the corn? Would flaming the corn kill that cover crop? So the question is, would flaming the corn uh, kill the cover crop? I guess it will. Um, uh, we're not considering uh, flaming. I think we're more thinking about mowing, but I, I guess it could be a good idea. I have, I really have no knowledge on how to kill the cover crop by flaming it. Um, so the last thing was interceding um, cover crop in corn. So, uh, so this is not no-till. This is more for uh, soil improvement by having a growing cover crop uh, during the, the corn season, but also after you harvest the corn. Um, so we planted the, the corn on June, 8, on June 8th, and then we came with the cover crop uh, a month after when the corn was at B5. The cereal rye was planted 180 pounds an acre, the red clover 10 pounds an acre, and the bacon radish uh, 10, 10 pounds an acre. So you see on the pictures that all the cover crop actually developed. Uh, oh yeah, what I didn't mention is that we had a, a normal corn and we had an inbred corn. And it's important here because the inbred corn was uh, much smaller and, and the, the canopy closure didn't really happen, so it was more light going through to the soil. So what we had uh, after harvest is on the left side, you see it was after the, the classic corn, and on the right side, it was after the inbred corn. So the, the cover crop grew in both cases, but through August in the typical corn, all the cover crop died because we had a very dry August. So it suffered a lot from the combination of shade and drought. And, and just the, the the slightly higher amount of flight that it got inside the inbred corn made it enough for it to to make it through the end of the season. So we will try interceding again. And that's pretty much all. Thank you for joining and listening to me even if you're super hungry now. <laughs> and there is a fact sheet that is there for yeah, which wraps up all what I say. I, I do want to stress from the early planted, this was, a, this was the fourth year of data for the early planted soybeans into the boot stage that we have had at Arlington. There were two years from a rather, another research program that um, was um, implemented by Josh Posner and Dave Stoltenberg. And their two years, they found a benefit of that early planting and then crimping over the, um, the emerged soybeans. You, from Leia, didn't, I don't think you stressed this, but again, that timing between the strategy of planting at the boot stage and then waiting. We were trying to get a two and a half week window because we really want to wait till those beans get to the V1, V2 stage, to so the first true leaves. If you go in earlier than that um, and the beans are at the hook stage, you're go you are going to damage them with the crimper. It's going to decrease the stand even more. So there, there is that timing. I'd, I'd, I'd wait, and this is where though you really have to assess your entire system, wait till the beans get to the right stage. But again, from those two years worth of data from the other research program, as well as our data in 2016, there was a yield advantage to planting early. So how much of that was related to multiple issues this year with a cooler, wetter spring? Um, the, the rolled rye offers advantages um, in terms of wet springs for cultivation, but you still have issues if it's wet at planting. It, it doesn't necessarily offer you advantages there. So how much of it's fur closure? How much of it, close mentioned, it could have been slugs. Um, it could have been the army worms. Um, but how, I think, it, it, again, there's no silver bullets. I'm trying to understand more about um, as, I think there's all an organic and with these cover crop based no-till systems, you always have to have a plan B and maybe even a plan C. So never get yourself so much in the mindset of this is what I'm going to do. You have to respond to conditions and respond to the weather and maybe it's that if we do see on um, May 15th when we might want to plan at the boot stage that the weather projection for the next 10 days is cold and wet. It's not worth it, and you just want to wait to, to plant at that typical time at, at crimping. But I wouldn't, yeah, I think you have to make that decision because if you delay it too much, you're going to potentially not be able to synchronize that crimping at anthesis and um, getting to that V1 stage that you really need to get at. So, again, I, at this year's data, threw us a bit of a curveball with that, but we have three years worth of data showing that there is an advantage. But we always have to respond to yearly conditions, and even then, sometimes things are, Mother Nature is going to throw us a curveball.